Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and a very warm welcome to our guests who've joined us online. There are several hundred of you, actually. Um, Perhaps you won't see them all in the room, but they're all there virtually. Uh, big thanks to joining us. I'm Ian Lesser from GMF here in Brussels, uh, and we're really pleased to welcome you to this actually second second annual Philon lecture, which, as you see, is not so much a lecture, but actually a conversation. Um, and the purpose of this uh, is to... Um, to talk about some of the key themes that are facing us today in terms of Mediterranean affairs, but also, since it's GMF, uh, transatlantic relations. Our mission, very simply, is to strengthen transatlantic relations in the spirit of the Marshall Plan, and we like to try to do this looking south as well as in other directions, so we'll have a chance uh, to do that today. This is a, it's a very special event, actually, for us, um, uh, and we're very pleased to have with us Ambassador Alexander Filon, uh, whose name you see on this lecture, and and uh, it's the, 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 the point of this is to really celebrate, uh, Alexander, if I may, your career, uh, which couldn't be more appropriate because it includes Washington and Ankara and also many other places like, like Delhi. But uh, Alexander is really one of uh, Greece's most distinguished di modern diplomats, and we're delighted to have him with us uh, today for this. Uh, we're also, if you'll allow me a few words of thanks just at the beginning, um, this series really is the result of, and you'll see it here, the uh, Philon Fund for Transatlantic Partnership, which was uh, founded as an initiative by Fokion Potomianos um, in, well, to celebrate your career, Alexander. And you, I know you're going to say a little bit more before we uh, actually start, uh, and you'll get a bit more flavor of, of what was meant with the series. We're also really, really delighted to have uh, Katimereni, which is Greece's leading uh, daily newspaper um, with us today as a media partner, and they're also live streaming the event. Um, we're very grateful for that. Um, so before we get into our conversation, Alexander, perhaps if you'd like a few words from your side, again, welcome to Brussels. Thank you very much. I, Brussels is a city that I've often visited, but in thinking up of these series of lectures, we thought that sometimes people didn't always understand or rather neglected certain aspects of what was happening in the Mediterranean. We wanted to get professionals and politicians, diplomats and others to be able to focus on certain issues. And suddenly everybody's looking at the Mediterranean now because of the crisis, this crisis that we couldn't have foreseen. But somehow whether you can foresee certain events, you have to know that the Mediterranean had to be prepared to deal with some of these issues. And we were not prepared. So I think the events have shown that it was important to put an emphasis on this part of the world that was always a, a part that we, some people distinguish the north, the south. We have to look at it in, in a very general way. We have to see the Middle East. We have to see the effects that events have happening a little further. For example, migration that tended to be, has tended to be in the mind of a lot of people. That has affected the internal politics, for example, of Italy and any other countries. So these are issues that people, are real issues that people understand, even um, not just strategic issues, but strategic issues are in themselves key because NATO and the European Union are now very much involved in these issues and getting more and more involved in trying to find ways of dealing with these issues in as much as they can think a little bit outside the box and also to see that there might be opportunities sometimes to solve issues. I'm just thinking of, of, of one issue between Israel and Lebanon, how in thinking outside the box allow them to find a solution to this problem to do with the uh, continental shelf between the two countries. Now, the, as far as I am in my career, there were opportunities and opportunities that were lost. 
So I hope now, with this crisis, people will suddenly think, maybe we should not lose these opportunities when they come. And I think they will appear. And I'm sure that in conversations like these, some ideas will come up. And this is what we want, ideas, things that we can do. We have to deal with diplomacy, because that's my business. And diplomacy has to be based on certain rules, the law, the law international law, but practice of diplomacy. These are elements that will help us deal with these issues. You see, these are some of the thoughts that had crossed our mind. And I think, I cannot think of anybody better than Frederica Mogherini to deal with this. She is a great expert in this field. She has seen it from different angles, both as a national, as a foreign minister, and then in the EU, and then in this world of Brussels and the NATO. All this, I think she can bring all this together, and I'm looking forward to listening to her. Alexander, thank you. Thank you very much. And Thank you for being with us. Please. So we, we embarked a little bit, Alexander, already, and thank you on, a, on an introduction for someone who, in a sense, I mean, it's, it's a phrase that's so often used, but you really don't need an introduction, especially in this, especially in this town. But let me, if I could, just to say uh, for, for GMF, there's also a special significance um, because in addition to being rector of the College of Europe and former foreign minister of Italy and former high representative for foreign and security policy and vice president of the European Commission and, well, all the reasons why you're the ideal person to have for this conversation, you were also a Marshall Memorial Fellow of GMF. And so um, that, uh, I know, is very important to us and I hope to you. And so thank you for joining us. Um, we'll, we'll start right in. Um, it's meant to be an informal conversation and we will have a bit of a, a talk up here and then we'll open it up to all of you and also we'll be able to take questions online. So if you would like to send those in, um, I will get those here. Um, but maybe I could, I could just start this way. Um, and it, it follows on really from something that Alexander uh, mentioned. Um, there is a tendency to put these crises in boxes. You know, uh, Ukraine, yes, it's a transforming event in so many different ways which we can talk about, but it does tend to sort of most directly underscore sort of uh, developments east, developments north, developments east, uh, but in fact it's a global crisis in many respects, um, and not least uh, in the Mediterranean, for southern Europe, for the Middle East, for North Africa, um, for the space in the sea itself, many, many different dimensions. We'll talk about some of them, but maybe just a few opening thoughts about that connection between South and East and why it's important. Yes, well, first of all, thank you, Jan. Thank you uh, to uh, Alexander uh, and the entire GMF family. I always feel home when I uh, join you. Indeed, uh, uh, the fellowship has been... Uh, I always say that because I believe in that. I don't only say this in the GMF events, but also uh, elsewhere. It has been probably the most important turning point of my professional life. Uh, I learned so much about the transatlantic relation and the United States, as I would have never managed to do. And uh, I'm very proud that uh, um, starting uh, last year, we uh, started to host also in the College of Europe in Bruges, the fellows that are visiting Brussels. So I'm trying to reconnect the dots of my previous lives. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and and, uh, keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the, the numbers, the years, uh, 75 years, 50 years. It's a great work that the GMF is doing. And uh, I've, I'm, I'm honored and delighted I've been a little part of that and will always, uh, will always be. Um, broad topic. <laughs> uh, and my preamble is that obviously now uh, I do not represent any official position. So I'm a free thinker. Probably I was even before, but uh, even more so now. <laughs> but it also means that, uh, again, I don't represent official Official positions, and I don't. What I say doesn't uh, doesn't uh, um, doesn't uh, engage any institution, if not myself as a person. Um, indeed, I think what your starting point is very wise, and, and it doesn't surprise me uh, because uh, we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking binary. 
east versus west, uh, north versus south, east versus south, uh, how do we stretch the resources, the political attention, if we focus more on crisis in certain areas, does it mean that we take away our attention or our focus from other crises and other areas? And I actually believe that in the world of today, uh, this uh, simplification is quite misleading. Uh, because what, what, what we're actually seeing this, this uh, last month, uh, after the Russian uh, aggression and invasion uh, in, in Ukraine, is that actually uh, this is obviously uh, a European war. This is obviously for, for the first time after the Balkan Wars, a war on European soil. But this is, as you said, uh, an event that has global repercussions and that in itself uh, complicates even further and in some cases freezes even further some other crises that have been there for many years, if not decades, in the Middle East, uh, in, uh, um, in North Africa, in the Mediterranean, but also further away, exacerbating somehow tensions and polarizations uh, that have impeded for the moment to find solutions to other crises. And so uh, it's as if uh, this war um, would amplify and multiply uh, the, uh, the dramatic effects of other crises uh, and somehow make it more difficult to work collectively on a multilateral solutions to any crisis. If you think of uh, Syria, for instance, I don't want now to go immediately into mm. specific areas, but if you think of Syria, for instance, it's quite clear that uh, yeah, on one side you have probably Russia focused more from a military side on Ukraine now and so leaving space, but on the other side, if we had, the last time we had some, some glimpse of hope, uh, it was when we managed to put together different powers in a multilateral setup, and we still refer to that Security Council resolution, the 2254, of that time. So somehow, a crisis as the one we are facing, a war like the one we're facing today in Europe, in Ukraine in particular, is basically telling us that uh, international law uh, is disrupted and is challenged and violated. This is, at the end of the day, the root of every crisis and war we're facing in the world. In the world. And uh, consequently, or related to that, that the multilateral uh, architecture, the institutional multilateral architecture, uh, is facing uh, probably the most serious crisis of uh, legitimacy and uh, capacity to work uh, than ever before since uh, 75 years. <laughs> uh, and this is the real point that makes it so that what we're seeing today in Europe is relevant for the entire rest of the world, not to mention the nuclear potential implications. And this is another story. Absolutely. No, thanks very much. Um, you know, let me maybe ask you, because it is in some ways the starting point for our conversation to, to think about the implications of the war in Ukraine for this broader space. But in terms of the war itself, in terms of the relationship with Russia, um, in how do you, you know, are, are we ever going back to something more normal with Russia? Uh, and, you know, what would be required for that to happen? I mean, obviously, it's too complex a question and another, another theme to sort of, you know, how, does this, how does this end? But, um, but, you know, how could this end? Uh, or is, or is the, the sort of context for our conversation the fact that we're going to be dealing with this now, this situation, this confrontation for many years to come? Um, first, indeed, uh, I, I would need a crystal ball, and uh, nobody has nobody it. Has uh, it. Uh, and I guess not even the players of the game itself uh, know exactly what is the end game and how to get out of this, uh, and, and when, and exactly in which terms. Uh, the point is, in, in, in my uh, in my opinion, the point is that. Uh, um, first of all, you don't change geography. Uh, there are a few things you don't change. So Russia is not going to disappear from the map. The country is there to stay. It's a huge country with a huge population. And by the way, a European population uh, that uh, for a long time has been, um, well, not for a long time, but for a short but significant time, uh, has been uh, considered by NATO, first and foremost, but also by the European Union, as a partner, even a strategic partner. Uh, um, short window, but uh, mm. not irrelevant. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, um, the cycle um, changed completely, or maybe it never started for real, the positive cycle in, in, uh, in Russian reforms. Uh, and obviously, uh, what happened in, in Georgia and then in, uh, um, in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, obviously, with the annexation of Crimea in 2014, changed completely the, the, the picture. Uh, 
Is it going to be confrontation forever? Uh, I think that the point here is not so much uh, how we will shape relations with Russia. I think the point here is how is Russia going to face its responsibilities and its duty as an international power? Uh, when is Russia going to face seriously the need to respect uh, and uphold international law uh, and its role in the United Nations system and uh, its responsibility as, uh, as uh, yes, uh, as a, f a former global power, yeah. should I say yeah. so? That is the question. And I guess that nobody has, uh, has the answer, not even the Russians. The point is, I think that nothing stands still. And I cannot imagine a situation that goes on like this for decades, also because nothing is eternal and nobody is eternal. Um, what worries, one of the things that worries me a lot uh, is uh, how do we invest uh, especially having now a sort of academic role, how do we invest in the younger generations in Russia, um, in uh, contacts, in uh, education, in uh, academic research, in, uh, um, in, in uh, challenging or fighting misinformation in, inside Russia, so that uh, some links can be kept or some seeds can be planted for the future relations. Because at a certain moment, I imagine and I hope, that uh, things will um, will start to be discussed. And then there's another angle where probably um, the United States uh, uh, have more instruments than, than Europe at this stage, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the military connection, the, the military, the conflicting, or at least uh, some channels mm -hmm. to be kept open to avoid the wars. These were open all the time during the worst of the times. Yeah, Actually, some time, some of the uh, some of of the key steps, for instance, on on arms control, have been done during the worst crisis. Absolutely. So that might be that on the military side, there could be some some maybe on this. I, I speak without knowing, but guessing um, there might be some some instruments, some ways uh, to keep at least uh, at least uh, um, some some elements of uh, the conflicting, or at least uh, trying to avoid worse developments. And potentially, maybe, also future steps. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that point precisely, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you're, you're underscoring something where I completely agree. I mean, in many ways, the Cold War uh, you know, balance and relationship between the Soviet Union and the West uh, was more stable, was less risk-prone than what we have today, when a lot of those arrangements around arms control or risk reduction have simply atrophied. And, and the places where Russia and others come into contact that are potential flashpoints for this are not limited to the East. I mean, it's true in the Baltic, of course, but it's also possible in the Black Sea. It's possible with Turkey or in Syria or in Libya or in the Sahel. Absolutely. And this is, uh, this is bringing us back to the starting point. Uh, this uh, is uh, somehow uh, a global a crisis that is global in nature because uh, we are living in different times and there is no way to, uh, to encapsulate a conflict in a geographical area, it immediately uh, connects different dots in different continents because players have, have, a, pl have a game in different continents. And indeed, this can, this can um, trigger um, escalations or worsening of situations that are already escalated since a long time. Uh, or just uh, uh, the complete lack of progress or hope for progress in some other situations where, um, where a situation that was already very bad uh, is, is now even worse. But uh, you, you started your question, um, your previous question, uh, asking if we will ever get to some normal with Russia. And I guess that I was, ask I was asking myself, what is the normal with Russia? Because uh, if you look mm. back, if you look in the last, what, um, 50, 100, 150 years, thousands of years, I, you know, some would argue that this is the normal. Some would argue that we had a, a, a bracket, a parenthesis of relative <coughs> global cooperation uh, and, and multilateral mm. successes that lasted for a very short time, a couple of decades, not even, and that now we're going back to the usual conflictual world disorder that, yes, during the Cold War was sure. frozen somehow in an ordered manner, uh, but conflictual. But before that, we have, we have experienced, uh, starting from Europe, but not only, thousands of years of conflict and wars. So some would argue 
chaos, conflict, war, confrontation is the normal, and we are now going back to this normal. I hope this is not the case, because I like to think that what we managed to build, including with, uh, um, with uh, the Marshall Fund and uh, the entire post-Second uh, World War architecture, world architecture, I hope we've managed to to create at least the awareness globally that uh, um, living in peace, even if you're not friends, is still more convenient than making war, which is the European lesson. But it's true that this last uh, uh, nine, eight, ten months, this last year, uh, has challenged this concept enormously. Absolutely. And the point you were making about uh, sort of the, the generational perspectives on this, uh, you know, a generation of people growing up in Europe, several generations, in fact, growing up in particular in Europe, but also in the United States, without any of these big animating conflicts. This wasn't necessarily true if you were living in the global south, of course, which is much more insecure. But that's, you know, there is a generational kind of recognition. Uh, people have become complacent, in a sense, about, about this stability, this period of stability. Let me, if I could, ask you about, about something else, related but slightly different. Um, the perspective from Southern Europe, no, it's not a uniform perspective, perspectives from Southern Europe, let me say, uh, even maybe even from Italy if you want to comment, but, but thinking across Southern Europe, you know, differences in Europe uh, in terms of the politics of this crisis, approaches to sanctions, uh, approaches to Russia as an adversary or a partner, I mean, we can see around many places in, in Europe a certain nostalgia for the old Soviet Union on the one hand, a certain uh, bizarre attraction to Putin on the other. Okay, maybe at the margins of politics, but it affects, it's there in society. I mean, how, just maybe talk a little bit about how you read that in Europe at the moment. From my Flemish observatory from, of Bruges. From, yeah, yes. There you are, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yes. That was a joke. Uh, no, 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 it's not. I, 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 you know, now I live in Belgium, so uh, um, the southern perspective is something I see from, from the north, uh, but something that I've, uh, I've, um, I've known well uh, uh, before in my previous life. Uh, you know, I, seriously, I, I think... Um, Obviously, there are, there are different experiences when it comes to history and geography in Europe and elsewhere. And it's normal that history and geography um, influence or even determine partially the politics of countries and communities and public opinions. This is natural and this happens everywhere in the world. Uh, because perceptions um, change and the perception of a threat, the perception of a challenge, the perception of uh, a certain urgency, changes, uh, depending on where you are and what you see, what you live, what you experience. This is not only true when we talk about geopolitics or, or in this case, Russia. This is also true regarding global issues. Uh, if you think of the last uh, three major crises that we faced uh, before this war, uh, if you think of COVID, uh, if you think of the migration and refugee crisis, uh, and if you think of the Eurozone crisis, uh, the three, all of the three, uh, were felt uh, much more strongly probably in uh, some of the southern European countries than in the rest of Europe, just to make an, an example. And the level, what I have observed from my Nordic observatory, but knowing well the south of Europe um, and coming from there, is that uh, it's not just politics, is uh, politics responds to the perception of priorities of public opinions. And obviously, if you face a situation on the ground that is of a certain kind, and it's different than the one that you perceive in Estonia or in Ireland, uh, obviously the pressure on the political level is higher, and the, the level of anxiety and urgency to give answers and to respond to a situation is different. And we have faced this during all the crises we've faced in Europe, that the countries, the member states that were feeling the most the urgency of that particular crisis were pushing more for having immediate answers or answers of a certain kind. And others were a bit more, I wouldn't say reluctant because of political reasons, but just took a little bit more time to understand the reason why that was felt so strongly. And I think the same applied somehow. I cannot compare a war that has been intentionally started by, uh, by Russia with um, a pandemic. That's a different, obviously, situation. But this to say that uh, the same happened somehow, having some member states, some countries, uh, taking much more time to realize uh, the pressure, the urgency, and the sense of threat 
that was perceived so clearly and so even physically in some other parts of Europe. And I think that the good part is that today, and actually starting from, from, uh, um, from that dramatic February uh, this year, I've never seen Europeans and also the transatlantic community as united mm. as it has been. Never, never. Uh, Europe is always, the European Union is always accused of being slow, of being divided, of not being effective. I have to say, this time, packages of sanctions, military support for the very first time put in place uh, using the European Peace Facility, excellent cooperation with the United States, uh, NATO, EU, everything worked exactly as it had to, to work, beyond expectations, mm -hmm. I think also beyond Russia's expectations or, or, or yeah. fears, um, in, in a remarkable manner. And I think that if we have a lesson that we can learn is that, yes, indeed, in these last years, but also with the reaction to, to, to COVID, for instance, in these last years, the European Union has developed a level of unity and uh, effectiveness in the response to crisis and this war that uh, was not there before, which is in itself, I hope, a lesson that we would learn and bring with us for future crises, hopefully not of this kind. Uh, in Italian, we say, uh, it, it's even enough, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> we, we've been tested enough. Uh, uh, it, we, can, we would accommodate with less <laughs> than, right. than this, but indeed to the test of a war on European soil, I would say both NATO and the European Union and the partnership within Europe and the European Union and the United States has worked perfectly well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, just to maybe to follow up on that, I mean, what you're describing, I think, will also have um, you know, consequences for how Americans see Europe as a partner. I mean, in this endless burden sharing debate, which is there for real reasons, uh, you know, the notion that Europe can act, can do things, can spend, we'll see, uh, but certainly can act, uh, you know, with real, with real effect and do it with, in very close cooperation with the United States, I think, you know, is, is a sort of sends a signal to Washington, whatever the administration. Absolutely. This administration is inclined to read it that way, of course, and we'll but, see. But I think the midterm elections were somehow also a sign that this is a reading that, uh, in general terms, the, mm -hmm. the American public, uh, uh, well, even if it's probably not so focused on, on Europe in this moment, but more on domestic issues, but still, that there is a sense of understanding that we're on the same side of history somehow, that we are on the same side of values and, and actions but I'm looking ahead. I hope that, uh, first of all, I hope this is true and this stays over time. But also I hope that this doesn't lead at a certain moment to a sort of division of labor on, perceived on the American side, as of saying um, the US supports the military efforts and then we leave reconstruction and, uh, and uh, um, the economic uh, and financial support uh, uh, to Europe. That might be a, a trap, and I know that the German Marshall Fund has been working on, uh, uh, on, on this uh, very wisely, because I, I was just yesterday, just across the street here, um, at uh, the, the Kiev uh, Investment Forum, organized by, mm -hmm. uh, jointly by the municipality of Kiev and of Brussels, and uh, spent the entire day discussing how important it is to start investing in the reconstruction while the war is going on, because this is a way to plant the seed of hope and to motivate uh, people in Ukraine, uh, and, and also to, to start the practical um, future. Uh, and uh, I hope that the United States will not, uh, at a certain moment, say, okay, we focus on the military support only and drop or diminish or leave for the Europeans uh, the economic uh, investments and the reconstruction of Ukraine. Because I think we have to do the two together. The Europeans have to do the military support together with NATO and the United States, and I think the United States have to uh, have all the interests uh, in, in doing, uh, together with the Europeans, uh, investments on the future reconstruction of uh, no. Ukraine. No, thank you for mentioning that, and, and you're, you're quite right. We have been very focused on that, and my, some colleagues of mine did a wonderful report on this. It's just the beginning of, of work on this, but the, the basic point was you know, that the governance of, of reconstruction in Ukraine, in, in the spirit of the Marshall Plan, if I can say, uh, you know, that thinking about that has to start now because for the United States to feel, as you say, vested in this, that it's not just a European responsibility, uh, is going to require some interesting political work actually to make that happen, whatever the administration you know, may be over the next years. And so, um, but thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. Also because uh, now jumping back to the Middle East or other areas, I think we have one of the other lessons we've learned is that uh, a war is not only one militarily 
or lost military, <laughs> what happens next, what happens the next day is as relevant as what it happens on the battlefield. And uh, 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 yeah, this, is, uh, exactly. this is an important lesson to be kept in mind, even exactly. if Ukraine is not comparable to any other situation that we've had recently. Maybe so we talked a little bit about Europe and Southern Europe, and, and maybe I could take you a little further south, because these questions of, of sort of, are we on the same page, if I can put it that way, in terms of approaches to Russia, and approaches to this conflict, approaches perhaps to other things like China in the future. Anyway, it gets, it gets a, to be a more difficult question, I think, but tell me if you agree, when you start to go into what you could describe as the global south. But even in North Africa, I mean, clearly there are countries in, in Africa itself that, um, that have a much more, let me say, nuanced view of this. So something far away, this, this is a problem affecting us but emanating from Europe. Um, they, they, there is a desire for a kind of equidistance, which I think many in the north or the west find uncomfortable. Uh, do you perceive that? Well, um, yes, <laughs> I think there is, uh, um, there are, uh, it, it is, it is visible where this comes from. And I think it's the fact that sometimes uh, there has been the perception or the real lack of attention from some corners to other conflicts. So the feeling in some continents, in some countries, some regions in the world, that their conflicts was, were less important than ours if we can say an us and them, but still that the, there were some forgotten conflicts, some forgotten crises, uh, or also and even that some crises have lasted for decades without the international community being able to solve them. Think of uh, uh, the Middle East peace process, which is even ridiculous to mention because there is no process. Uh, so, uh, or, you know, the Horn of Africa, the Sahel, uh, you know, um, the list is long, but even Syria or Iraq, I mean, Yemen, you name it. Uh, so I think there is, a, an, there is an understandable, um, not necessarily justifiable, but understandable re reaction, uh, human reaction, and translated into a political one, of saying, uh, wait a minute, this is not the only conflict in the world. You care about this because it's, it's close to you, which is legitimate and fair. Uh, and also, uh, probably, uh, there is... Um, there is a misperception, and uh, this is what worries me the most, about what the conflict in Ukraine is really about. Uh, and I think we have a responsibility in Europe, in the United States, uh, in other places in the world where the full uh, meaning of this conflict is well understood, to use the right terms and the right narrative. This is not uh, the West against the East or the rest or the Global South or the leaders of the Global South. This is the violation of sovereignty and international law by a country that has nuclear weapons and uh, is a permanent member of the Security Council. That is it. An invasion, an aggression, a military aggression, mm -hmm. violating sovereignty and changing, attempting to change borders of a sovereign state by a country that is not one of the many, has had quite a relevant sure. place in the international inter architecture. Is it the first time that it happens in the world that one country invades another? Sh certainly not, but it's, I think, quite relevant that this happens at this scale by a country like Russia <laughs> that, has that, that had that kind of international standing um, in such an evident manner, and again, touching, including the threat of using nuclear weapons, and we see the implications that um, that um, military activities around nuclear facilities could have, not only in Europe. So I think that it is extremely important to go back to the global South perception, to part, to, to to portray, to, to to build a narrative around what is happening in Ukraine, as as it is, as a blatant violation of international law by someone that was supposed in the UN system to be one of the guarantors of the international law, right. in principle. That is the point. That is, for me, what it is about. And so it's not about the West or Europe or transatlantic. For me, it's about the right of every single country in the world to be safe in its own borders, knowing that its own um, right to exist as a country, as an independent, free country, uh, is not challenged by another country and even more 
than anything a country that is sitting in the in the Security Council as a permanent member. Absolutely, um, and producing crimes against humanity in the process. Um, exactly. Uh, um, let me ask you maybe about, and I want then to open it up to all of you, so please, and there are also some online questions which I think I'm going to be able to see. Um, Turkey, a critical partner for the European Union, for the United States, for NATO, uh, an important place, an important actor, an assertive actor. Um, to say a little bit uh, about that, and maybe we'll come back uh, in, as part of the questions to this more specific question of uh, you know, stability in the Aegean and things like that, because I'm sure there's a lot of interest. But, but just in general, this question of Turkey in this equation between Russia and its partners transatlantic. This is a question I would ask you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know it. I don't know if anybody knows. Um, I, it, it's it's a difficult equation to decrypt. I think that Turkey has um, first and foremost uh, um, economic issues to to manage mm -hmm. domestically, and I think this is the compass somehow. And elections coming up next spring, yes. which is another compass probably mm -hmm. uh, for for anything that happens there. Um, and I guess that these are the two elements uh, that are um, at the moment guiding whatever Turkey decides to do or not. Uh, and then Syria, uh, which is uh, obviously um, another element there. Um, I don't think I have enough insights on, uh, on on Turkey to say how and how their posture will develop. But I, my guess is that uh, internal domestic economy and the electoral campaign will drive uh, rush, the, the Turkish action uh, from now to sp spring, summer, sure. uh, at least. I, I, don't, I cannot say in which direction, um, and I cannot say without, with, with which kind of openings. Uh, from here to then, and even more so after that, um, that I think is, is a big question mark. Yeah. Um, but I think um, what, what uh, indeed um, the role of Turkey in this uh, takes together, keeps together the role of Turkey as a NATO ally, even more so than mm -hmm. as an, a European Union partner. Uh, I think that the, the, the angle through which we need to read Turkish actions today should be, at least in principle, uh, its membership to NATO uh, and uh, its regional role. Uh, in in a region that is suffering from the war in, in in Ukraine in a contradictory manner, because some countries in the region are suffering a lot, mm -hmm. food, energy, um, and and the overall even more stalling situation mm -hmm. for some crises. Others think of the Gulf are actually not really uh, suffering that much if you think of uh, oil prices. So I think there is uh, there is uh, an overall feeling of uh, having a situation that in the region, in the, middle, in the wider Middle East, uh, and I didn't mention Iran and its positioning, uh, obviously uh, backing Russia in this conflict, but uh, which is an issue for Turkey, obviously, uh, given the recent uh, triangulations that they had tried to, 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 to put forward, in particular on Syria. But uh, uh, I guess that, that the Turkish um, equation uh, needs to be seen indeed uh, with this three, uh, through these three prism, the NATO, its role in NATO, uh, its domestic agenda, economy and electoral, and its role as a regional player, knowing that different players in the region face and relate to the war in Ukraine with different agendas, sometimes conflicting ones. No, thank you. And, and I know, um, and I want to now open it up to, to all of you for questions. And if you would just please just tell us who you are and where you're from, that would be, that would be fantastic. But if you'll allow me just to insert one that I, I got uh, yesterday, um, uh, it's a, a question actually from Katamerini. Uh, not surprisingly, they would like to just follow up on what I just uh, asked about. But maybe just to ask you more specifically about you know, this, this question as it's perceived of Turkish assertiveness and the Aegean and an attempt to overthrow the order in the Aegean, whether it's around energy or it's around other kinds of things. Um, I don't think either country, if you'll allow me to comment myself, is interested in a conflict, obviously, neither Greece nor Turkey. Uh, but the risk, just as in 
<coughs> Ukraine, the risk of something going wrong and spilling over uh, into something bigger is clearly there. I mean, accidents, incidents, things that can escalate, um, especially at a time of heated politics. I mean, you you saw that clearly in your in your time in official positions. Um, it's not gotten better. What? Let me maybe focus on. <coughs> share how you might assess that if you like, but you know, what can be done about that? What can the partners of, of you know, within EU, or maybe it's in NATO where everyone has a seat at the table, you know, how, do you, how do you reduce the risk at least, if not fix the problems? Another uh, crystal ball is, question. <laughs> is it about the people, for example? I mean, there's a sense that maybe we don't have enough of this sort of people-to-people -people diplomacy or... Uh, uh, you know, second trackish kinds of things. Well, first of all, not everybody is sitting at the table in NATO because Cyprus is not there, for instance. Right. <laughs> uh, and this is, by the way, one of the major formal impediments for EU NATO cooperation that uh, happens a lot informally, but on certain levels uh, is, is impeded to happen in a formal, in a more formal way. Um, what, what is it missing? Personally, I, I'm afraid, having seen a bit the dynamic, uh, I think uh, the main uh, problem, the main issue uh, is, uh, but I'm not a Turkey specialist and, or an Aegean specialist uh, or an Eastern Mediterranean specialist, so, but out of my own experience in the, in, in, in the past years, uh, I think it's a matter of uh, prioritizing the domestic agenda uh, over the regional one. Uh, if you have a domestic audience, and maybe this is my political background coming up, I mean, um, I've, uh, I've left politics, but I've been grown up in politics. So if you have a domestic public opinion, if you have, or, and if you feed it, uh, that somehow um, demands, requires, or, or appreciates a more confrontational, assertive, uh, or, or um, a less cooperative approach uh, to regional issues, you would tend to enter this vicious cycle, uh, circle of alimenting this and then feeding it and then fulfilling it. Um, it's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy somehow. I'm afraid that this is, this is the point. Um, I, can I say it's a matter of political leadership? At the end of the day, some very difficult steps have been done, even in difficult conflicts, even in the, the difficult region, think for instance of the PRESPA agreement between uh, Greece and North Macedonia, nobody would have expected that breakthrough to come after so much time and so deeply controversial um, touching national identities and, and so on and so forth. And that was for me a miracle of political leadership. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I'm afraid it's not so much the lack of contacts. I think that in the region around the Eastern Mediterranean, people understand each other much better than we we think. I, I tend to be, maybe this is the Italian uh, or the, very much the Mediterranean approach, but I tend to think that when people eat the same food and use the hands in, and the gestures in the same way, they basically understand each other much better than we think. Uh, the culture is, is actually, uh, I mean, is portrayed as very different, but um, the coffee is the same. And uh, <laughs> that makes something, that makes something. Uh, I, I think it's the political agenda that is diverging. And then, till and unless the political agenda, uh, the political leadership will be directed towards finding solutions, toward finding um, uh, more cooperation than confrontation. I don't think there is any any space, or there is always space for for improving improvement. But I don't see the breakthroughs coming. Okay, and you're giving us some wonderful ideas, maybe even for follow-on lectures in the series. Food security. We, food, well, precisely. Food diplomacy. Food, well, yeah, <laughs> the geopolitics lot. of food, the cultural side of this, which is not unimportant actually. And so, please, just in the back, and then we can go over there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yanni Zografis. I'm a retired journalist and uh, cons media consultant here in Brussels. Uh, Signora Mogherini, do you think that uh, the conflict in Ukraine may, may end up, especially in the eastern regions, like the Palestine-Israel war or conflict in Europe? And how long do you think it can last? Frozen. No, no I don't right. think it can. Uh, I, I think already now, you know, I, I always refused, even when I was in office, I always refused to use the term frozen conflict because I think it's one of the worst things you can say. Uh, also because for the people that are living in the conflict, there's nothing frozen. <laughs> it's a conflict. Uh, so no, I, I don't, 
Again, I don't have the crystal ball. I cannot predict how things will go. But personally, I don't think that it would be um, it would be an option. It would be um, a way to to settle uh, that of uh, of uh, yes freezing uh, or or crystallizing a situation on the ground. Having said that. Um, uh, here uh, and, and in Europe uh, in, in general, the, the principle, and I wish this applied also in the Middle East actually, is uh, the ownership uh, of the people. And uh, it will have to be for the Ukrainians to define what is their end game and what is and will be at the end of the day uh, their way out of, uh, of a negotiation, of a war uh, beyond the military ground, but also on the, on the political and diplomatic side. The, 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 As, as, if I understood well, you mean the Ukrainian way out of the conflict, but what about the Russian way out of the conflict? I cannot predict neither one or the other, obviously. The point that I'm making is that, first of all, I don't see, first of all, I don't see any conflict as a frozen one, first. Uh, second, I think that we should not, as Europeans, as transatlantic community, uh, give up to any conflict as and accepting any situation as a frozen one, not even in, in the case of the Middle East, for instance. I, I'm, I'm over, I, when I, when I uh, started my, my office and my mandate as high representative, the first, very first visit I paid outside of the European Union, but I think it was the second day I was in office, was to Gaza. And I said that I was firmly believing that uh, within the end of my mandate, it could have been possible to establish a proper Palestinian state. And I really believed that, and I still believe it. I still believe that this would be possible with political will, uh, I think this is probably one of the easiest conflicts to be solved in the area because more or less we know we know what would be the solution. But this to say, I don't think that the idea of accepting a frozen situation, a frozen conflict, uh, and on, especially on the basis of a precedent that would determine that a military invasion would change borders on European soil, but not only on European soil, in international law, would be something acceptable by the international community. I don't think that this could, personally, I don't think that this could be an outcome. I, but what I've said is that this is what I think. But then it will have to be for the Ukrainians to have ownership of their negotiating position once negotiations will ever start, if they will ever start at a certain moment, they will. And yes, sure, I talk about the Ukrainians, I don't talk about the Russians, because in this war, there is an aggressor which is Russia, which is clear. So it, it is natural that it will be for the Ukrainians to determine their own conditions to negotiate uh, if and when there will be a negotiating table on a diplomatic side. I, that's, that's part of uh, the diplomatic rules that Alexander was mentioning before. That's, that's how it uh, normally happens, even if there is nothing normal in this situation. That's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just on this side here, if I could, on the aisle. <laughs> Thanks. Microphone is en route. Uh, Miguel Diaz retired most recently with the State Department. Uh, your comments triggered two questions. One, one, one comment was that you felt that the international multilateral architecture is stated or might be insufficient for the times, which raises the question to me of whether Russia should be long in the, in the Security Council or whether there should be a United Nations at all. Um, the, the other question is more of a personal question. You describe yourself as a free thinker. Or, and, uh, I, free I've been, for sure thinker, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I wondered uh, how that played into your role as High Commissioner. In the case of the State Department, there is a mix of personality and, and institutional drive that defines uh, the role that a High Commissioner or a Secretary of State uh, plays. I wonder whether that mix uh, uh, it, it was appropriate, whether there is a better mix for a future high representative. I, I, I'm not going to ask you to compare yourself to the current uh, no. a, 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 a high representative, but I, I wonder how you, how you balance 
the personality versus the institutional in carrying on your responsibilities? That's a great question. Uh, it, it, it's the first time I'm asked, actually, and it's, uh, it's great to, to reflect on that. Um, I think, uh, I, first of all, I love the job and I, I wouldn't change a, um, a comma of uh, neither the treaties nor the way in which the institutions uh, uh, work. And uh, um, I found that the European Diplomatic Service is one of the best I've ever not only worked with, but also interacted with from the outside. So uh, I was perfectly happy with the system and the machine and my role. And uh, uh, the reason why I stepped, uh, uh, I mean, I, I decided to stop after five years is the intensity uh, of, uh, of the job that is basically, uh, yes, 24-7 uh, the entire year. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I also like to live my life. <laughs> so at a certain moment, I thought before it becomes too late and I get, you know, trapped into the uh, institutional, um, and also because there are other ways to contribute to, to the European integration, and I love this one too. So, uh, but I, I loved every single aspect of uh, of that job, uh, and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't introduce any different balance or any different uh, uh, setup, neither on a personal level nor on an institutional level. I found that it had exactly the right uh, solidity of institutional background, the institutional memory and the institutional positions somehow, and the space for shaping it uh, from a personal point of view, from a political point of view. I was just explaining this morning to, to some of uh, uh, our students uh, that uh, uh, there is a difference between uh, representing um, uh, a country um, uh, as a foreign minister, for instance, or as a diplomatic service, and representing the European Union as an HRVP or as, uh, as the External Action Service, or in any case, the European diplomacy. Because somehow, uh, at the national level, well, maybe in the United States it's a bit less so, uh, there is more space for shifts. While in the European Union, external positions, there is an institutional setup that grows and is the result of an internal negotiation that needs to be recognized, preserved, and then brought forward. Uh, so there is somehow more weight for the, um, for the institutional position, uh, because it's not just a minister that changes the course, or the administration that changes the course, and the 27, 28 at my time, because I left before the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, um, that that is a position that needs to be uh, to be to be shared and, and negotiated internally. Um, and, and when the HRVP speaks, it speaks on behalf of the 27. In my case, 28. Uh, so you're not just shifting. And the 27 or 28 represents the entire spectrum of political positions from the extreme right to the extreme left, which doesn't normally happen in one national administration. It can, but normally doesn't. Uh, Having said that, in my personal experience, um, my balance was this. Uh, again, probably it was because I uh, used to have um, a political institutional background, having been served in the Italian parliament and the Italian government, so my background was political. My own way to interpret this balance between political, personal political drive and institutional uh, setup, um, established position, uh, was very much um, the people to people. Uh, I was in contact with ministers, sometimes prime ministers, presidents, and chancellors on a regular basis, uh, sometimes in some cases uh, even weekly, uh, to measure. Uh, the space, uh, to measure the trends, to measure what was uh, possible to shape in terms of European positions, even in parallel uh, respect to the formal council meetings and the formal council positions. So I had a thermometer of what was politically sustainable uh, at the side of what was institutionally decided. And that helped me always. I never, never, never um, had to, and I never did it. I never uh, checked with the member states before making a statement uh, um, in a press conference or publicly, apart from the official positions that obviously need to be institutionally decided in the councils. But for instance, I give you an example. Uh, when the Trump administration announced that uh, the US was withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, um, I definitely didn't start calling the 28. Uh, I had like a couple of hours to go in the press room and, and say the European position, but I knew what was the European position because we had discussed this, we had exchanged before that, we had prepared for that because we saw this coming. And so I took responsibility of my own words 
being confident that this would have reflected the political space that I was representing. Um, so I never suffered uh, this element, but I know that in some cases this has happened or happens, I don't know, but uh, I know for sure that this has happened in the past, this sense of, uh, of uh, um, a bit being restricted because you're representing many, uh, and uh, the sense of needing to check and double check before exposing yourself. In my case, I never suffered that. Maybe because, again, there was a, there was a certain um, flow of constant uh, exchange and, uh, and probably because I was a minister myself before, so I was I was just changing seat in the council, but I was part of the same family, so there was a certain familiarity, even if ministers obviously changed. Um, and in this respect, let me say, it's crucial and it's key and it's very important uh, and, and good that the high representative sits at the European Councils because this gives you the opportunity to not only listen to the foreign ministers but also to the heads of state and government. And especially when there are governments that are coalition governments, it is important to see sometimes different um, nuances. Uh, and this gives you the sense of what uh, is the general position that you can express and represent and shape and, and forge. Um, the other question was... Um, oh, <laughs> you, you know, this is a tricky question. In, it, when I was a representative, I had a, 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 a smart rule. Uh, when I was in the press room, a journalist could ask the question, but then I could pick and choose which one I would have answered to, which was very, very convenient. No, but... Uh, you know, you're, you're touching an element that is, uh, I think, it's not only related, to, obviously your question relates to Russia and it's not for me to say, but uh, I think that this war has unveiled uh, a structural issue that uh, that the international architecture has and, and it's a serious one. Uh, I was asked a couple of days ago uh, if uh, um, w what I think about um, the European the European seats in the Security Council, if we should go for one or if we should coordinate more the permanent seats, uh, France, the UK having left, and I realised when I was asked this question that you know maybe five, seven, ten years ago this was one of the key questions. With the world of today. Obviously, how the Europeans are represented in the Security Council is important, but it's not the key point anymore. The key point for the Security Council, in my view, humble and, uh, again, as a free thinker outside of the UN system, is all the rest. I mean, who is represented and how is the Security Council still representing the real powers and the real dynamics in the world? Not to mention the veto power, that's uh, something I've always been against, uh, to in the Security Council, uh, uh, in the European Union, actually, I'm, I'm quite a supporter of that, but that's another story. But um, the, the point is, does the international architecture represent the reality of today first? And this is partially answering also the anxieties of the Global South. It's a picture that is a picture of 70 years ago. Uh, is the picture the same? Not sure. And second, um, is it effective in handling or preventing crisis and conflicts? And I guess that we all have clear answers to both. Uh, then how to address the reform of the Security Council or the UN system is, is even more difficult because it's a self-reform <laughs> by definition because it's the international community, in principle, reforming itself. Uh, so it's it's like when you ask the parliament to, to have a reform of the parliament itself. It's good luck. <laughs> good luck. Yes, please, just right again on the aisle, but right across. There you are. Thank you. Alexander Lungarov, uh, uh, Institute for International Law at uh, KU Law and, and uh, formerly at uh, European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, my question actually ties in with uh, the previous question and uh, your comments to it. Um, it's clear that the uh, situation in Ukraine has challenged our conception, interpretation of international law. Thinking a bit more midterm and of other global actors coming up either demographically and or um, economically, China, India, Ethiopia, Nigeria. How would you say that, and also thinking proactively and not just uh, wondering about the crystal ball, how do you think the 
transatlantic access Europe uh, and uh, its partners would be able to engage in a positive and constructive uh, relationship with those actors to avoid the exploitation of conflicts which are there also in the Mediterranean, even if they share good food. Thank you. Uh, easy. All, all easy questions. <laughs> uh, I hope so. I think, uh, I think we have an interest in doing so. Uh, I, I, I observe a trend uh, that is understandable uh, and that is not partisan. I think it's now quite established uh, in the United States uh, to to um, to um, found to 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 root the choices of uh, foreign policy and even security policy uh, into domestic considerations. I think this is, uh, in Europe we would say, an acquis, uh, something that is quite um, now um, into the DNA of the, uh, of the politics and policies in the United States, understandably. Uh, also because the United States have realized that they have issues to take care about at home, and that is for the good of the rest of the world too. So. In Europe, uh, I, on the contrary, you see the, the reverse trend, uh, more awareness of the fact that Europe needs to take responsibility globally compared to the past. And maybe the two trends are connected, uh, could be. But I think that uh, regardless of that, there is an interest uh, both in Europe and in the United States, uh, in the transatlantic community, un united or separately, to um, engage, to understand, to listen, uh, to respect uh, stories and concerns and also policy priorities that come from other angles in the world, um, which I think allows to be tricked on the international law architecture. I think that the more you're open to dialogue and engagement, in a respectful manner, the more you can credibly afford to stay strict on the respect of international law as it exists today, then some of these players would question who has written the rules. Also this, historically, fair enough. But if you want to preserve the, a certain system of rules that guarantee that there is a certain fair and sustainable order in the world, I think you cannot neglect that the players are growing in numbers and they need to find their place and they need to find their voice and they need to find places where these concerns and these voices are heard and come to, uh, come, come to decision making. Um, this cannot be confused with the disruption, the total disruption of the principles, I believe, of international law and respect for uh, for um, rules-based international order. The point is who writes the rules, and the rules normally, if they want to be respected, need to be written together and recognized and acknowledged and legitimate by all. That is the point. Have we come to a point where we need to rewrite or reconsider the international order? Not me to say. It might be clearly uh, the middle of a, a war like the one we're seeing in Ukraine is not necessarily the moment where this can be done. But yes, the international order as we know it today came out of the Second World War. You know, I'm conscious of our time. We started a little bit late, but let me take uh, perhaps one more and then we can close. Please, right here. Thank you. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. My name is Pauline Manos, and I work in the private sector in capability building, where being a practitioner is valued as, uh, as being a, a builder of capabilities. And I'm curious, as you've gone now into the world of academia, how you are seeing the, the need for change, if change is needed, in order to develop these generations of the future, in order to develop the out-of-the-box solutions that uh, that Ambassador Filon was talking about to come up with the brave political leadership needed to solve problems like the Greek-Turkish situation when two countries are facing elections in the spring. 
but more in your personal experience now as you've gone into that role? I love this question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, this is exactly the reason why uh, I am today the College of Europe. Uh, because I, um, I felt and I thought uh, that uh, I had seen um, institutions and practitioners and officials from different angles, going through different institutions, national and European and international level, having served a bit also uh, in the United Nations uh, as a, a coordinator of a high-level panel on internal displacement. I've seen different systems. I've seen very good officials, very good diplomats, and also some that were a bit more frustrating <laughs> um, for, for, for me personally. Not many, but some still. Uh, and I, I feel that a key element of developing sound, solid, capable, uh, efficient institutions, um, which at the end of the day means investing in peace, security, and development, uh, is the quality of the human capital we put in the institutions. Um, the policies don't live by themselves, the policies are shaped by human beings and, uh, and even more so they are, they are implemented by human beings. So the quality of the machine, the quality of the human capital in the institutions at all levels, local, national, regional, um, European, global, whatever, uh, is key to me uh, to, um, uh, to ensure that there is a functioning um, interaction. Uh, at all levels, uh, and what and this is why I'm actually at the College of Europe because that's the place where most of the officials, at least of the European institutions, but also some the private sector and the global, international or national institutions, come from. Um, and what I tell them, uh, as my lesson learned, having served with many uh, practitioner, uh, practitioners and officials, uh, is some very basic rules, but for me never. Um, repeat it enough, especially to the younger generations. One is to study hard and to know the fights. Uh, to not to not to, uh, not to um, uh, underestimate the power of knowledge, because at the end of the day, if you are around a negotiating table, and Alexander might confirm that, if you are in a difficult situation, if you are by either in a bilateral or national situation, if you are around a council table. At the end of the day, yes, it's about political leadership, but it's also about knowing what you're talking about and being on top of your files. This makes the real difference. Uh, second uh, is to keep the originality of who they are. I see so many, I have seen so many young officials or practitioners, but I'm sure that in the private sector is the same, entering a system, and I've done that myself, entering a system and thinking, I have to talk, dress, behave as they do so that I enter the club. I will always remember the very first day before my the day before my very first day in office, not in office here, but in my in my first office, in my first job, uh, that was long ago. Uh, the, the, the day before, I went uh, shopping to buy dark clothes because I thought that I had to dress uh, black uh, to to homologate, uh, to to be part of uh, of uh, what was perceived to be mainstream. And what I'm telling the students is, uh, obviously, you know, you need to know the system and the rules of the system, and you have to play by the rules, but keep the originality of who you are, because that is the added value without which the system perpetuates itself without realizing what is wrong, because if it was not wrong, we would have solved problems before. So what I tell them is be brave in bringing to the table um, out-of-the-box thoughts, proposals, they will kill 99% of them and maybe 100% of them. But we'll ne you never regret you know, saying, but maybe this could be done, even if it seems absurd. Because if nobody does that, we keep doing the same things. And clearly, there are things that are not solved with what we're doing today. So uh, these are the two. And then I add also a little advice uh, that is a personal one, and that is doing what they like doing. Because what I've seen in my daily life, in my daily work, has always been this. People that do what they are passionate for and about do it 100 times better than those that are doing maybe something they know very well, but they don't feel any passion for. The energy, the passion you put in something you believe in is uh, 100 times more, and so the efficiency is 100 times more than if you're just doing your homeworks. Federica, thank you. Thank you. I mean, this, no, this has really been a, a wonderful conversation on so many levels. We, we talked about the theme, but we also talked about a lot of other things which were 
to allow me even more interesting in a sense, but, but very personal. And we're really very grateful to you for, for sharing those things with us. Um, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank it's you. a great, great pleasure. Um, let me also, if I, if I may, just before we leave, also uh, some further thanks. Uh, Alexander, thank you for being uh, with us. Uh, we wish you good travels back to Greece tomorrow. Uh, our great thanks to the Philon Fund for supporting this and for the idea. Uh, our thanks to Katrimerini uh, for helping us with the outreach for this as well. And as always, my thanks to my colleagues at GMF for making this happen. Uh, and in particular, uh, to Alberto Talia Pietra and also Amin Sam. Thank Thank you very, very, very much. And many others uh, who helped. And to all of you for joining us. Uh, and I don't think it's raining anymore. So a very good evening to you in Brussels. Thanks so much for joining us here and online.